Good Sunday morning, members and guests of Williamsburg Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for today's virtual service. If this is your first time at one of our virtual services, a special welcome to you. Our church has decided to keep doing these for a while for the safety and health of all of our members. I would ask that everyone pay attention to the prayer list and prayer requests that have been sent out during the week in our church notes and that we keep all of them in our thoughts and prayers for the coming week. Tim Brewster has asked for prayers for his mother and sister-in-law and Jim Whitney is now recovering at Williamsburg Landing following a second stay in the hospital. We also want to keep the college students who are returning to campus in our prayers during this difficult time. We pray for their safety and health as they go about their business and taking their courses and trying to social distance and, and to stay safe. Today we welcome back to the pulpit the Reverend Art Wright, who he has been with us for multiple times during the past months. He is the theologian in residence at the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship of Virginia in Richmond. He will be with us through the month of August and possibly beyond. We are all grateful for all he has done for our church and look forward to his sermon today. One final re reminder, all are welcome to our Sunday evening worship or, or social uh, fellowship time by Zoom. Anyone can join that, and if you don't have the link, let our church office know and they can forward it to you. But it's at 7 p.m., and it offers a time for us to see and catch up with each other while we're not able to be at church together. And now, if you will join me for our call to worship. In a time of bitterness and pain, God raised up Moses and changed the lives of a people. From the shadow of death, God raised up Jesus and changed the lives of all people. In every time and in every place, God raises up witnesses, people whose lives are changed forever.
Good morning, my friends. It's that time again. It's time for this week's Talk with Children. Please gather around your computer or streaming device for our talk. <laughs> Hello! Hey guys, how are you this week? Good. 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 I'm doing pretty good too. How are you guys doing? Good. So, I brought along some snacks with me today. Does anybody here like these? Um, I don't. Do you want some dog treats? I know, that's pretty gross, huh? Um, let's look at the flavor. Mm, it's beef flavor, so it should taste pretty good. But you know who does like these things? Mm. Dogs. But this doesn't sound very good for us. I mean, wouldn't you rather have some fruit or some cookies or something? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, my dog really likes these treats. Do you, any of you guys have dogs? I bet you if you do that they love treats. You know, a dog will do just about anything for a treat. They'll sit, lay down, roll over, some play dead, some like to fetch a ball. If the dog knows that he or she is going to get a treat, that dog will do just about whatever you want. But you know something, when, when a dog does something for a treat, they do it for selfish reasons, don't they? When you first train a dog, the dog becomes conditioned to do tricks because they get a reward. If you weren't waving one of those yummy treats, they might just walk away and ignore you. You know, sometimes we respond to God that way too. We act nice and pray because we want God to give us a treat, don't we? But God doesn't want us to love him like that. Whether we're having good times or bad, God wants us to love him and thank him for all the things he's given us. A man named Job modeled this kind of love. God decided to test Job and he looked, took away everything good thing that Job had. But Job refused to walk away from God. Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. When good things happen, we should rejoice and thanks God. But let us not forget to thank God also in the bad times, because no matter how bad things are, it's still God. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day and for allowing us to worship together. Thank you for being with us, not only in the good times, but also during the bad times. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We want to thank you so much for joining us this week, and we hope you have a fantastic week. Until next time, bye. 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 Have a good day. Grace and peace to you, Williamsburg Baptist Church. I'm so glad, glad I could join you all in worship last week, and I'm glad to be with you all again this morning. As we move into our time of prayer, let us continue to be mindful that there are a number of needs both within our congregation and in the community uh, and world at large. Um, so we are praying for members who are homebound and feeling isolated right now. Uh, so many of us are feeling the pain of separation from family and friends and loved ones. Uh, we have members who are dealing with various health challenges. And so many of us in general feel anxiety about our health and safety in the midst of the pandemic. We continue to pray for the leadership of Williamsburg Baptist Church as they work to make wise decisions as they guide the congregation through this season. Meanwhile, we continue to pray for our broader community, for our nation and our world. We certainly continue to offer prayers for progress toward racial reconciliation and justice. And we're also praying as we navigate a difficult political context in our country as we move toward November's election. We pray for civility and a willingness to dialogue and listen uh, rather than the, the current tone that seems to be conflict and division. So let's open our hearts to God's presence in our midst. And may we also open our hearts to the needs of others in our congregation uh, in our community and in our world. Let us pray. God of grace and God of mercy, we find ourselves in a difficult season. 
one that we know requires patience and sacrifice. Help us to be gentle with ourselves as we find that we need to show up in unexpected ways and on unexpected days. We need your help, oh God. God, we don't know how to hold the weight of expectations and we feel our limitations as we navigate various pressures, boredom and isolation, the demands of work, the uncertainty of finances and unemployment, worries about health, or <laughs> constant parenting, a desire to work toward justice in our communities and world, and yet often uncertainty at how best to do that, volatile national politics and a pandemic. We need your help, oh God. Meet us here in our humanity, for we know as Paul said, that your power is made perfect in weakness. May the gentleness we give ourselves pour out in our interactions with our families, our friends, our neighbors, and even those who aggravate us or with whom we disagree. We need your help, O oh God. Be with us, Lord, and help us feel your presence in our midst today and every day. And lead us, Lord, as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
And now, if you will bow with me for our offertory prayer. Merciful Lord, you have provided each of us with many similar yet unique gifts. Thank you, Lord, for the talents and abilities of the people within this congregation. We are a blessed people. Now we unite as one body to share in this worshipful act of the offering. Giving is such a joy-filled experience. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to support the transformation of people's spiritual lives through the ministry and mission of this body of Christ. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. I wonder if you will take a moment to turn to Matthew 16 with me. Last week, if you'll recall, we were in chapter 15 of Matthew, and Jesus encountered a Canaanite woman. If you watched last week's sermon, you will remember that this was a Gentile woman, an outsider, an outsider to the Jewish faith, who approached Jesus and called out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, Son of David. These were Jewish messianic titles on the lips of a Gentile woman, and I wondered perhaps uh, last week, if, if perhaps Peter was standing in the background, taking notes as this bold woman proclaimed her faith in Jesus. Because this week, Peter will be the disciple to step forward and confess his belief that Jesus is the Messiah. So uh, we pick up reading in Matthew 16 at verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to him, them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I must confess as I launch into today's sermon that there were at least five sermons percolating in my head uh, in response to this passage this week. It's such a rich text that invites so many different avenues of inquiry. It was hard to pare it down and try to um, fit it into our worship uh, in, in this virtual space. Um, but I will say this, the, the passage that we just heard holds a special place in my life. Peter's confession of Christ played a pivotal role for me while, while I was on my own faith journey, especially in college. Uh, years ago now, I wrestled uh, at length with deep questions of who I really thought this Jesus guy was. Even though I had grown up in the church, as I entered young adulthood, I found myself asking critical questions as I worked to make my faith my own. What did it mean for me to say that Jesus is the Messiah? What does it mean to confess that he's the son of God? Was Jesus and is Jesus who people think? Uh, and should I just take their words for it? 
looking back, I recognize that this moment was a stepping stone into a more mature faith. At the time, however, it was incredibly difficult as I wrestled with these tough questions. The confession of Peter that we read today in chapter 16 became an anchor point for me and my personal study as I wrestled with these big questions about Jesus. I think so many of us find ourselves at a pivotal point in our faith journey where it is as if we're in Peter's shoes in this story. And Jesus says to us, you have heard all these things about me, whether from your parents or friends, uh, in church or in your own particular community context. You know what all these other people say to me, but who do you say that I am? And in the midst of my wrestling, I came to a point where I could say and respond honestly and authentically, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. I eventually came to a point where my faith in Jesus was no longer simply an inherited faith, but now fully my own. Yes, on the one hand, shaped by my family of origin, by mentors and the traditions of my church, but with my own peculiar way, way and distinct understanding as well, uh, as, as so many of us have. Uh, and of course, faith is dynamic and ever evolving, and my own understanding of Jesus continues to evolve over time, but I continue to find myself drawn to this passage and this powerful, succinct confession by Peter. But let's, let's back up a little bit and take a, a little bit closer look at this story. Today's passage begins with Jesus on the move. Last week we saw he was in Gentile territory as he encountered the Canaanite woman. In the end of Matthew chapter 15, which we didn't read last week, uh, he feeds a multitude of people. And in the beginning of today's chapter, which we also didn't read, but maybe is worth reading later today, there's a conflict with some Jewish religious authorities. Today, Jesus and his disciples are on the move. They head north of Galilee to Caesarea Philippi. It is a city built by Herod the Great, a wealthy tyrant of a king who ruled as an instrument of Rome, of the Roman Empire. And by Jesus' time, it was famous for a shrine devoted to the god Pan, and also a temple honoring Caesar Augustus. Uh, furthermore, it was the administrative center of Herod's son, Philip. Uh, so when Jesus visits the region, hang on to this thought now, it's safe to say that issues of power and politics and sovereignty uh, are at front and center in Caesarea Philippi. Now, the text doesn't say explicitly why Jesus comes here with his disciples, but I do think that it's interesting that in this context, Jesus chooses to ask this particular question to his disciples. Who, who are people, how are people talking about me? What's the chatter? Tell me what it sounds like through the grapevine. Um, and the disciples respond with this long list of prophets. And it's not imagine if you were a first century Jewish person thinking that this miracle working teacher named Jesus was cut from the same cloth uh, as this long line of prophetic fi figures. But they, they respond, and then Jesus gets to the real question, I think. But who do you say that I am? He puts them on the spot, and he asks them to, uh, to, to try to, to put into words uh, who they are understanding him to be. I imagine the disciples looking around at one another, shifting nervously on their feet, perhaps, wondering who has the guts to answer this significant and loaded question. And lo and behold, it's Peter who steps forward, perhaps not surprisingly, because he's so often a, the mouthpiece of the disciples. Uh, and it's rather remarkable to reflect, you know, Peter is what we might think of as an un, undereducated fisherman from backwoods Galilee, and yet he has been paying attention. He has seen Jesus's compassion and healings. He has heard sermons about justice. Peter has tasted bread that has been multiplied to feed thousands, and he has even walked on water only to, be, to sink and be saved by Jesus. And so here he puts the pieces together and makes this bold confession. 
You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. It, a, it is a response that points to Jesus' divine origin, to his special identity as God's agent in the world, uh, and the one empowered to inaugurate the kingdom of God on earth to help make the world look like God desires it. To believe in and to confess that Jesus is the Christ fundamentally changes the way someone relates to the world and to other people. It does for Peter. It shapes the entire trajectory of the rest of his life. This is a pivotal moment, a reorienting of Peter's worldview, now centered on this person of Jesus as Lord. And yet we know that this was not a decision or a confession that he simply made in this moment. We know that not only has this moment been building for 16 chapters in the Gospel of Matthew, but we also know that this has been a lifetime in the making for P Peter. I have no doubt that there were parents or mentors in his life that shepherded him into a life of faith, as well as synagogue leaders who shared the sacred stories of Jewish scriptures with him. Faith is not a one-time decision we make, is it? It's always a journey. Peter has this dramatic moment of confession, of claiming this belief in Jesus as Messiah, but it will be quite the journey on the other side of this confession too. And spo spoiler alert for next week, you'll have to come back and listen. Peter's going to blow it. Uh, it's going to become clear in some of his words next week that he just doesn't fully understand what it means that Jesus is the Messiah. And Jesus is going to level some very harsh words at him. Peter makes this step of faith not knowing what he's getting himself into. He has no idea where this journey leads, and that's okay. Can any of you relate? I, I know I can. Sometimes we have no idea where this life of faith is going to lead us. I want to linger on one more thing about Peter's confession here, because I think it's especially relevant to the season we're in, especially um, as we find ourselves barreling toward November's election. Jesus' question to the disciples and Peter's response raise interesting questions of politics and allegiance, especially given that it's in this city, Caesarea Philippi. Caesar Augustus, whose temple was nearby, was known as Son of God simply because his adopted father, Julius Caesar, was deified, was known as a god after his death. So uh, interesting that those the Caesar Augustus on the one hand and Jesus as the other are both called son of God. I wouldn't be surprised if perhaps Jesus and his disciples were standing in the shadow of Augustus's seat, temple when Jesus asks this question. And so this confession that Jesus is the Messiah, is the son of the living God, on the lips of Peter also points to an allegiance, to an alternative Lord, and to an alternative vision of the way the world should be. One not ruled by Rome or ordered according to its death-dealing purposes, but rather one oriented towards God's life-giving purposes. It is a relevant message right now in the midst of our election cycle. I have a feeling that things are just heating up and it's only going to get uglier before it gets better. So today's text invites us to consider where our true allegiance lies in the midst of all of this. In whom do we put our faith as we watch party politics and conventions unfolding in the media? And how does Jesus fit into the divisive politics of our country? It's a complicated question, one that we can't fully explore uh, in this format or in this time that we have, but uh, let me be clear about a couple of things. Nothing in this text suggests that you shouldn't vote. Uh, if you can, I think you should. Nothing in this passage, passage suggests that you can't have political op opinions. Of course you can. I have my own. But what this text does is it reminds us that our true allegiance as Christians is to God through Jesus Christ. And as Christ followers, we are called to be peacemakers and agents of reconciliation in our divisive and partisan world. 
Now, how in the world can we be peacemakers and work toward reconciliation in the midst of what will be likely be an intense election season? Again, it invites a longer discussion. Uh, and you're welcome to add your comments below here in YouTube. Just be mindful that they're public. But here are a couple of my thoughts. Uh, and this is maybe just a baseline of decency. Let us always speak kindly and not in anger. Let us seek to listen and understand the opinions of others, even if we don't agree. And by all means, let's, let's think twice before we say mean things on social media. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in this election season, remember where your true allegiance lies. Let us be peacemakers. Let us be bridge builders and agents of reconciliation in the months ahead. One, one final word, uh, as we move to the end of this passage, Peter makes his confession and Jesus responds with a blessing. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. And I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. This in and of itself is a fascinating statement, one that we could again, unpack for hours, one with layers of questions and various interpretations. But let me again zoom in on one point that I think is particularly relevant. Did you know that this is one of two passages in all of the Gospels where Jesus explicitly uses or mentions the word church? It's, it's fascinating. Uh, Jesus anticipates the founding of the church. And I think with this mention of the gates of Hades, Jesus also imagines the array of difficulties the church is going to face in the decades and centuries and even millennia to come. I can't help but think as I hear Jesus' words here that the gates of Hades sure seem to be arrayed against the church these days. It's a hard time to be church. The pandemic, partisan politics, Work and, uh, and conflict over racial justice and reconciliation. I mean, the list goes on and on. Everyone I know is struggling with how to do church and how to be church right now. I read an article in um, Baptist News Global this past week, and in it, a pastor recounted a Zoom call in which he and nine other pastors were checking in on one another. And, you know, lo and behold, four out of the 10 pastors in this one Zoom call mentioned that, that they had had su suicidal thoughts recently as a result of the challenges of pastoring during a pandemic. Pastors care so much, but it is a brutally difficult time right now for congregational ministry. It is just a hard time to be church. And, you know, when I pause to think about it, how could it not be what we are attempting is to reinvent how to be church right now. We have taken almost 2,000 years of tradition of gathering in person to worship and read scripture together, to fellowship together, and to engage in mission in our communities. And we've had to radically reimagine what each of these look like in a short time period. We have, you know, found ourselves in conflict over our, an array of differences of opinion over masks and safety and whether to worship in person or not, uh, over politics and technology, it is impossibly hard and it is scary. It's scary for a lot of churches. I think it's fair to say that congregational life has been going through Hades these past few months. And yet, I'm finding great comfort and I, as I read these words. The church is built upon this rock, not just Peter, but also this foundational confession of faith in Jesus as Christ. Hear me when I say this, it is a really hard time to be church right now, but the foundation of who we are as a church is stable. The foundation of our church isn't the building where we worship, it isn't the number of butts in pews on a Sunday morning or the number of views on YouTube, it isn't the offering in the collection plate. The foundation is this confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. I'll say it one more time. It is a really hard time to be church right now, but the foundation of who we are as a church 
is stable, okay? We are gonna make it. It is hard and is no doubt gonna continue to be hard, but we are gonna make it. Thanks be to God, amen. Friends, hear these words of benediction. Go in peace. And as you go, remember, in the goodness of God, you were born into this world. By the grace of God, you have been kept all the day long, even until this hour. And by the love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, you are being redeemed. We are being redeemed. Amen. Go in peace.